morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was at Corinth, Peter took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this time of gathering, this time of listening for your word. And I ask that either because of me or in spite of me that you bring a message to your people this morning. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. In preparing uh, for the sermon today on baptism, I quickly discovered that uh, it would take at least a sermon series to try and cover all the different topics um, in dealing with baptism. So this morning's sermon is by no means exhaustive of everything uh, to deal with baptism, but my hope is that it'll, it will inspire you to want to learn more, not only about your own baptism, but about baptism in general. Uh, but this morning, I'd like to begin by sharing some stories of ways that baptism gets misunderstood. And the first is a story from the book, Baptism, Christ's Act in the Church. One of my seminary professors, uh, Lawrence Hall Stuckey, and some of you, if you're Peter, Paul, and Mary fans, you may recognize that last name. His cousin is Paul Stuckey from Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, but he wrote much of the baptism liturgy that you find in the hymnal and has revised that. But he shares the story of a girl named Lucille who was taken by her maternal grandmother to the local Wesleyan chapel to be baptized. Lucy's father, a sturdy Anglican, was skeptical about the whole proceeding since the Church of England does not regard Methodist clergy as being in the apostolic succession. So he took Lucy to the Anglican parish church where she was baptized again. Now Lucy's mother was a convert to the Salvation Army and didn't think much of either the Wesleyans or the Anglicans, so she took Lucy to the local citadel for presentation under the banner of blood and fire, the Salvationist counterpart to baptism. In time, the family immigrated to the Midwestern United States. The community they moved into had neither an Episcopal church nor an army citadel, so the family attended the Methodist church. As a teenager, Lucy joined a class of those preparing to take the vows of church membership. Now, it happened that the pastor was one of those mavericks who looks upon the practices of his own denomination with disapproval and regards the baptism of infants as a misguided tradition. He therefore decreed that all in the class had to be truly baptized at the font on the day of their vows. Lucy's mother discovered what was afoot and said, absolutely not. Three times is enough for anyone. But Lucy was a good psychologist, and she knew that once her mother was seated in church, she would, not make, she would uh, not make a scene. When the rest of the group went to the font, so did Lucy. Now it came to pass that some years later, Lucy fell in love with and married a Southern Baptist, but not without extracting from him a pledge that she need not be baptized yet again. He agreed that she was quite sufficiently initiated into the church, and all was well until they moved to a community where they attended a Baptist church that was in need of a pianist. Lucy loved to play and seemed to be a providential gift to the congregation, but ruled the deacon solemnly and steadfast, steadfastly, unimmersed hands may not play the Lord's songs for us. And so for the fifth time, Lucy was initiated into Christ's church. Oh my goodness. Anybody going on five times being baptized? Um, and this is not an uncommon story, even my, in my own family, my uh, niece Tamara, my sister's daughter, 
Um, was baptized in the Episcopal Church here in the United States, and then we traveled to Ireland to have her baptized again in her father's home church, Catholic Church, in Ireland. A friend of mine named Brian Atha uh, was one of my youth leaders in my last church, and we had talked quite a bit about baptism, and he married a young lady who was from the Disciples of Christ Church. So when they left that church and went to her church in Harford County, um, he soon found out that he would not be able to have any leadership positions or anything else in the church until he was baptized again. So um, it's interesting the misunderstandings and misconceptions that we get into. In fact, we often get calls at the church from people who want to get their kids done. In other words, baptized. Um, we call that the old splash and dash. They come in, get their kids splashed, out again. We should use super soakers, right, John? That would work out great. So these misunderstandings about baptism, I would say, are the fault of the church and each of us who claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ. The church should do a much better job of teaching uh, the meaning and practice of baptism, not just through liturgy, as we do on Sundays when we're doing a baptism, but also through Christian education as well. Each of us who is a disciple of Christ should also take it upon ourselves to study the meaning behind our sacraments and traditions. Why do we do them? As a historian, I was taught that when a people fail to learn the lessons of their past, they are doomed to repeat the same mistakes. Take, for instance, offerings and Holy Communion in the church. In the early church, communion was part of worship each and every week. The whole congregation would bring together gifts of food, money, and other resources. The food would be part of the communion feast. See, it wasn't just bread and cup. It was a complete feast that they would put together at this time. All that were gathered would only eat as much as they needed. The rest, along with the money and resources, would be taken by the congregation to be given to those in need. In other words, anyone that had need in the community, orphans, widows, those who were, that were suffering from poverty or other illness, they would give to them food, money, resources, whatever they needed to help sustain them in that time. It's interesting even to look at what some of the Roman historians wrote down. Uh, one quote was found from the Roman emperor Julian who complained that the godless Galileans, in other words, the Christians, feed not only their own poor, but ours as well. Today, we only practice Holy Communion once a month. Does anyone know why? Anyone know why we do that? Any former confirmants? Amanda? Exactly. We, we fail to remember the reason behind our tradition. The original purpose was more practical uh, than scriptural. See, in the early Methodist church, we had circuit riders. And the circuit riders could only get around to the church once a month. So we had communion once a month. But when they went station, and we had the ability to have communion as often as possible, which Wesley called for, we didn't do it because we were used to only having it once a month. So still to today, we do once a month because that was the tradition from back when the circuit riders were there. Once again, practical, not necessarily scriptural. In the same way, the meaning behind baptism has been muddied over the years. As we see in the stories that I talked about before, some people believe that the power behind baptism is dependent upon uh, first of all, the denomination that it's coming from, as with my friend Brian. Um, some believe that if you're not a believer who's making your own choice about baptism, that the baptism isn't real. Others are perfectly content uh, with having infant baptisms. Some believe that their denomination has it right and everybody else has it wrong. So therefore, even if you were baptized somewhere else, you have to be baptized in their denomination for it to be sufficient and real. This is a misunderstanding of baptism. There's others that believe that it's about the person baptizing, that if the pastor is not holy enough or worthy enough or not in the right position, that the baptism isn't real. And this even goes back to uh, the early days of the church. 
uh, when many Christians were being persecuted, there were some pastors that gave up the names and locations of other Christians for fear of their own life. And after the time of persecution, when Christianity became a part of the, um, the religion for the Roman Empire, many clergy members went back and sought out those clergy members uh, that had turned over Christians for persecution and said that none of their baptisms, nothing that they had done, was good anymore. So they went about trying to rebaptize a whole bunch of people that were baptized by these clergy members, if that makes sense. There's also the idea that the knowledge or readiness of the person being baptized is necessary, that if you don't truly believe, if you haven't made that choice or that commitment yourself, that you are not ready for baptism and should not be baptized, meaning that the power of baptism lies in the person who's making the decision to be baptized. Misunderstanding. There's also the idea of the timing of baptism. There are some that believe that... um, you have to be baptized before you can go to heaven. So therefore, they're rushing to get their kids in to be baptized quickly in case something might happen to them that would keep them from being able to go to heaven. Once again, another misunderstanding. Another question that has been debated over the years, can a person be saved if they are not baptized? So let's take some time now to set the record straight and answer these questions. And we'll begin by taking a look at our gospel passage for today. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He proclaimed uh, about the one who is more powerful than he is coming after him. And he said that he's not even worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. John said that he baptized with water, but um, the one coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. See, we have to take a look. John the Baptist was not an Essene, which was a a sect of Judaism living off in the desert that was trying to reestablish the people of God. Um, But he did like some of the things that they were doing. They were bringing about baptism in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the Messiah. They had a date much later um, in mind for when this would take place, and John was doing it much earlier than they had thought. But John was doing a practice of baptism that was a ritual cleansing. That was a part of the Jewish faith beforehand. You would do ritual cleansings, um, and you would be baptized if you were a convert to Judaism. So that was nothing new at the time necessarily. Um, And even today in Judaism, those being converted to Judaism also must be baptized as well. But it was more about the ritual cleansing aspect of things in preparation. But how about the baptism of Jesus? How is that different? It's more than just a cleansing. Notice in the whole part about the baptism of Jesus, it says very little about John. It says that he was baptized by John in the Jordan. But then listen to the rest. And just as he came, was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. You see, the power in Jesus' baptism wasn't just the water. It was what God was doing in the midst of the whole thing. It was about heaven coming down. It was about the spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove. It was about something brand new. It was about God calling Jesus out for who he was, for recognizing him as the Christ and announcing his calling and his mission in that moment. You see, in that moment, God showed that the power of baptism was God, was God. Had nothing to do with the denomination, had nothing to do with a specific priest or pastor or whatever. It had to do with what God was doing in the midst of baptism. The power behind baptism as given to us by Christ 
is from God. Uh, Lawrence Stuckey uh, says that baptism is God's gift to the church, Christ's act within the church. Martin Luther, the founder of uh, the Lutheran Church, described it this way. He said, the blessings of baptism are so boundless that if our timid human nature considers them, it may doubt whether they could all be true. No greater jewel can adorn our body and soul than baptism. For through it we obtain perfect holiness and salvation. Baptism is so full of comfort and grace that heaven and earth cannot contain it. So if the power of baptism is from and through God, then it is not bound to a denomination or a person, but to God through the Holy Spirit. In Methodist theology, we understand baptism to be a sacrament, as it is one of the things that Christ commanded his disciples to do. We also understand it to be a means of grace. In other words, a way in which we encounter God. As with Christ, we are washed clean in blessed waters. We die to ourselves and are raised in Christ as part of the body of Christ. We are anointed by the Holy Spirit and adopted as sons and daughters of God in God's blessed kingdom. In this way, we are redeemed to God and are able to become the greater versions of ourselves through the image God created us to be. This is God's gift to each person who is received into God's church through baptism. It has nothing to do with the denomination, the power of the person baptizing, the age of the person being baptized, or the knowledge of that person either. It is God's gift to us as a means of grace. So you may be wondering then, what about those who are not baptized or infants that die before being baptized? If baptism is a means of grace... It is not the only way of salvation. It is a way towards salvation in God. But the power is not in the, the ritual of baptism. The power is in what God does. So if God is able to do wonderful things through baptism, then why do we limit God to say, well, this infant died stillborn and was not baptized, so therefore they can't go to heaven. That would be ridiculous. However, many people try to make that assertion. We take away God's ability to be God. If we truly look at Scripture, we recognize that God is the one who decides who's go, who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, not us. So why put ourselves in the position of doing that? If we are all God's children and we are all covered by God's prevenient grace, then no one is outside of the realm of salvation. And we leave that to God to make that decision. Does that make sense? So it's not about the baptism that causes a person to be saved. It's about God's grace through baptism and many other means of grace through which people are saved. The good news for us who are baptized is that we have come into the presence of God through baptism and we have been blessed by him. We are water washed and spirit born. The more we grow in our understanding of what God has done for us through this sacrament, the more we will understand about who God is calling us to be as well. As disciples, we are called to follow the Great Commission, going into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching all that He has commanded us to do. One of the places we begin following the commission is at home. One of the things Pam and I decided when we started having children um, is we had a candle that we made for the baptism services. So Nathan was baptized at Hereford United Methodist Church, and this sat on the altar uh, during his baptism. And then when Joel was born, it sat here at the altar at Epworth as she was being baptized. We thought baptism was a very important thing. Both of them were baptized on Epiphany Sunday uh, at those churches because we saw, it as a, a, we saw each of our children as a gift from God, and we wanted to celebrate those gifts on the, days, on the day that the wise men brought gifts to Christ's child. So each year um, on Epiphany Sunday, we pull out the candle and we light it, and we have a time of remembrance of their baptism. We want them to remember what God did for them in the midst of that. 
This is something that we do, and it's very special for our family. Um, and I would encourage you to think of ways of being able to remember your baptism as well. What are things that you can do in your family to remember what God has done and is continuing to do in the midst of your life? As a way for you to remember your baptism this morning, I'm going to invite you all to come and take a stone from the waters of our baptismal font. In this, you will find uh, different stones here that are resting in blessed water. Um, like many, let's see, sorry. Uh, like many uh, of you, um, the, the stones have been washed in blessed waters. And I encourage you to carry it with you as a reminder that you are water washed and spirit born. You are made one in Christ's body. You are a child of God, and as such, you are being made into the greatest version of yourself that you can be, the image of God. If you have not yet been baptized, I invite you to take a stone as well, as you prayerfully consider becoming baptized. Um, and I invite you also to contact Pastor Trish or myself, so we can have some time of conversation and, and prayer and study together in preparation for your baptism. If you are baptized, you have already been washed in, this, in the water. You have already been touched by the Holy Spirit of God. If you have not, God continues to invite you to something that he's going to do special in the midst of that. The stones here in the water are just a reminder of what God did for you that day and what God continues to do for you each day. So in a moment, we're going to have music playing. And I invite you, if you would like, to come forward and take a stone um, and keep it with you and carry it with you as a reminder of your baptism and all that God is doing in your life. Amen. <laughs>